You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed. Finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. How easily are you taken in by marketing spiel and advertisements? Have you ever bought something that was available for a limited time only and lived to regret it? Chances are you've been the victim of what Robert Cialdini calls weapons of influence, the principles and techniques that have long been used to get us to act in the face of inertia or indifference. Robert Cialdini is a social psychologist and a world-renowned authority in the field of persuasion and marketing. His clients include Google, Microsoft, Bayer, Coca-Cola, KPMG, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Since its publication in 1984, his book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, has sold over 3 million copies and has been translated into 30 languages. But before all this, Cialdini had been no wiser than you or me when it came to techniques of influence. In fact, He says he'd always been an easy mark for salespeople, peddlers, and fundraisers. It had never been easy for him to just say no when asked to commit to something on the spot or to donate money. But he was a trained social psychologist, so he threw himself into researching this behavior. He answered newspaper ads for various sales training programs so he could learn firsthand about persuasion and sales techniques. He finagled his way into advertising, public relations, and fundraising agencies in order to glean the secrets of the psychology of compliance from professionals. In this book insight, we'll delve into what Cialdini discovered, focusing on his six principles of influence. They are reciprocity, or the phenomenon of people feeling obligated to repay a favor, consistency, or the way that people want to act in line with their commitments and values, social proof, which is about people looking to what others do to guide their own behavior. Liking, or the fact that the more we like someone, the more we are likely to agree to that person's requests. Authority, which is about our natural wish to cling to perceived experts instead of making our own decisions. And finally, scarcity, meaning the rarer something is, the more people want it. But first, Let's take a quick look at what influence is and the automatic responses that are easily triggered in us. Do you remember the early days of Apple's iPhone? Whenever a new model was released, spectacularly long lines would form outside the company's flagship stores. Some Apple fans would line up all night to be the first to own the new phone. Of course, you could buy a new phone from another maker for half the price, so the iPhone was essentially a luxury item. However, this luxury item was so popular and sought after in China, it birthed the phrase, selling your kidneys to buy an Apple. But how magical is a mobile phone, really? And why the irrational buying behavior? There might be instances when you don't want to do something, but there are outside forces triggering your behavior shifting your original intention, and creating an involuntary, conditioned response. When this happens, be careful. You're not really in control. In the case of the early iPhones, the occasional stock shortages triggered a scarcity reaction in many buyers, making them all the more determined to own one. Here's Cialdini himself speaking with Barry Ritholtz on the Masters in Business podcast. These things are hardwired in us, and we get we get cues that trigger those responses that are essentially unthinking because most of the time, if one or another of these principles is really there, authority, social proof, they do steer us correctly. Mm -hmm. So these people are essentially uh, hijacking our our natural tendencies by, by counterfeiting the cues for when we should undertake uh, action that's consistent with those tendencies. You, you use the- Cialdini introduces three types of triggers that may affect our conditioned responses and make us slaves to influence. The first is fixed action patterns. 
These are a kind of mental inertia or habitual thinking. When we encounter something, we are accustomed to making judgments based on past experience and without thinking. After tens of thousands of years of evolution, we have many fixed action patterns instilled in us which are unconsciously activated in the presence of certain triggers. We believe we are totally in control of our reactions, but canny marketers know better. The second type of trigger is a form of mental shortcut. Cialdini mentions a jewelry store in Arizona that was struggling to sell its turquoise jewelry. After one of the salespeople had mistakenly doubled the price on the labels, the mistake had a surprising effect. Customers quickly bought all of the turquoise pieces. Had the customers suddenly realized the jewelry's worth? Or had its quality suddenly improved? Neither. They were simply influenced by the belief that the higher the price, the better the quality. When our knowledge of the product is limited, our opinions are more likely to be guided by this assessment shortcut. The third type of trigger involves cognitive contrast. An example here is the way real estate agents sometimes take customers to see rundown houses when they're trying to sell property. By showing customers a few undesirable houses at high prices and then taking customers to see the houses they really want to sell, something interesting happens. Customers feel they have found a great buy when they see the high-quality house for the same price as the bad-quality one. The real estate agent has just used the power of cognitive contrasting. Most people dislike those who ask for things, yet never give back. Most people also don't want to be disliked. Due to this, people willingly comply with the law of recognizing and repaying gifts and graces. This is the power of reciprocity at work. Across the world, reciprocity has long been the best aid to influence. Here's Cialdini on Masters in Business once again. I think it's both hardwired in us over a long period of time. If we give back to those who give to us first, that's the rule of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. Right? Uh, then people will want to be with us, will want to work with us, will want to exchange with us. If we don't do that, we have very nasty names for people who take without giving in return. We call them moochers or takers or teenagers, actually. <laughs> Here's an example. A lot of businesses like to send a small number of free samples to customers so they can test whether they like other products the company offers. But the true intent of these gifts is to imbue a sense of indebtedness in the customer. It's a common feeling to believe that merely taking a gift without giving anything back is improper, so many people choose to buy some products to return the favor. Cialdini identifies another kind of reciprocity impulse as rejection, then retreat. In a beauty salon, if the owner wants a customer to purchase a beauty treatment program, they will try to interest them in a three-course treatment. When the customer says the price is too high, the salesperson then offers a single-course treatment. The customer now feels that the other party has made concessions, and they are embarrassed to refuse repaying this kindness, so they pay for the single treatment. If the owner had offered the single-course treatment from the beginning, she probably wouldn't have made a sale. So what should you do as a consumer when you encounter the reciprocity principle? Firstly, you have to judge whether the request comes from a sincere place or simply from the intent to manipulate you. For instance, once you realize that the other party's concessions are merely an attempt at the rejection then retreat trick, you can rid yourself of the sense of guilt that they intentionally triggered, thus resisting the influence peddling of the other party. It's then much easier to say no. We began our dive into Robert Cialdini's influence, the psychology of persuasion. First, we learned that influence itself is the result of three kinds of triggers. Fixed action patterns, or habitual experiential thinking. Mental shortcuts, or opinions guided by lack of knowledge. And cognitive contrast, or the loaded comparison of two products. We also learned about reciprocity, or the use of deliberate generosity to incur guilt. Next time, we'll look into more of Cialdini's weapons of influence, starting with consistency. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memoedapp.com insights. 
That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. According to social psychologist Robert Cialdini, the first principle of influence is reciprocity, or gaining favor by forcing people to return your generosity. His second principle of influence is consistency. We'll learn more about consistency in this episode, as well as a few other principles of influence, as we continue our dive into Cialdini's best-selling book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. Once we make a choice or take a certain position, we immediately feel pressure from ourselves and the outside world to follow through in the way we act. Under such pressure, we will try our best to prove that our previous decisions and stances are correct. Those people whose beliefs, words, and behavior don't align are often considered confused, unreliable, and even sociopathic. Conversely, a high degree of consistency between words and deeds is often associated with strong personality and superior intelligence. Marketers take advantage of our desire to commit and be consistent. One of Cialdini's examples is the fundraising activity of the American Cancer Society. Social psychologist Steve Sherman attempted an experiment. Before a fundraiser, Sherman called the targeted residents first. He wondered out loud to the residents if they would be willing to help if the American Cancer Society needed fundraisers. As no one wants to be considered by others to lack compassion, many people replied that they were willing to be volunteers. After getting the residents' promises through this method, in a few days, the American Cancer Society called to ask the volunteers to organize a community fundraising team. The amount of volunteers multiplied by seven compared to previous campaigns. This is the power of asking for a commitment. Even if the commitment is initially small, people don't want to go back on their word. Another example. Big companies such as Procter & Gamble and General Foods regularly hold 25, 50, or 100 words promotional essay competitions. They ask participants to write a personal statement, beginning with a short prompted message like, I like a certain product because, whether it's a cake powder, floor wax, or other product. This is nothing more than a tactic to encourage customers to buy their own words about the brilliance of these products. The reason this technique is so effective, Cialdini says, is that the more effort a person puts into a promise, the greater the control that promise will exact over them. Those who expend real energy to acquire something are more likely to cherish that thing more. Remember those people who slept outside Apple stores? Having gone to some lengths to be the first to get the new iPhone model, they become walking champions for the company. They had to defend their commitment and be consistent. Cialdini notes how giving seemingly minor or unintentional answers can make us very vulnerable to influence. Imagine the scene. The doorbell rings, you open the door, and a well-dressed salesman stands outside. He asks politely, Hello, do you have a high-quality vacuum cleaner in your home? Your partner, surprised by the visit in question, doesn't know how to answer. At this point, you come to the door and chime in, a little embarrassed, of course we have a vacuum cleaner, but it's not of high quality because they tend to be much more expensive. We're fine with a cheaper one. The salesman then smiles and says, I have a very advanced vacuum cleaner here, and it's half the price of the average high-quality machines. You can try it out. He takes out a vacuum cleaner from his bag and sets it before you. In this way, the salesman has taken advantage of your commitment to use a high-quality vacuum cleaner. And as it's half the price of top machines, you now have no real defense against buying it. If the salesman had merely said, Would you like to buy a new vacuum cleaner? Or, Do you need an advanced vacuum cleaner? You'd have no difficulty shutting the door. But he's used the old trick of making you feel like you have to be logical and consistent in your answers. So how do we avoid falling for the commitment and consistency principle? Sometimes we say something nonchalantly and the other party will take the words and turn it into a commitment. So when you're buying something, just be aware of this kind of manipulation. If you decide you don't want something, just say no at any stage and without feeling you have to give reasons. Cialdini's third principle of influence? Here he is on the Masters in Business podcast. Social proof. 
if all these people think I'm legitimate, if all these people think I'm right, I must be right. When making judgments about the correctness or quality of something, we will act according to the opinions and actions of others. This conformity behavior helps us avoid making mistakes. Cialdini cites a theory called the Werther effect, named after the sorrows of young Werther, by the German writer Goethe. At the time, Goethe's novel was a sensation, despite its ending with the protagonist Werther committing suicide. The story's influence on its readers was strong. So strong, in fact, that in the wake of the book's publication, a wave of suicide swept across Europe. The epidemic led to several counties banning the book. Today, news reports about suicide still bring about the Werther effect. After seeing the suicide report, those who have suffered setbacks or confusion in their lives are quite likely to see it as an easy path toward relief. If others are doing it, they reason, then it's a thing. If social proof works even in such extreme, dark cases, it's easy to see why it remains compelling in consumer psychology. Here's another example. In recent years, more and more Chinese brands have taken their products overseas. Although Hire, Lenovo, Tencent, and others have made great strides, the unfamiliar overseas market still presents challenges. For example, in 2016, Huawei changed its logo color from red to black and white. Zhu Wenwei, head of strategic marketing for the company, said that though red is eye-catching, black and white is more international and low-key. Huawei had trouble convincing Western governments that it was simply an electronics company and not under the control of the Chinese government. It saw that in the West, red is associated with fire and blood, whereas black and white is more reminiscent of solemnity, purity, peace, and tolerance. The logo change was one way to make the company seem like many other successful companies. This is just one example of how, to strengthen their brand culture and international appeal, marketers have use of the social proof principle. Avoiding the traps of social proof requires judgment and vigilance. Keep in mind that truth lies with the minority, and you'll be able to protect yourself. For example, financial managers will often emphasize how many people use their product and how much money they earn within one year. But just because a certain number of people use the company's services, it doesn't mean that it is successful or good. After all, millions of people use the services of Lehman Brothers and of Enron, too. Now their reputations are ruined and both no longer exist. The crowd and social proof is sometimes wrong. The fourth principle of influence is liking. In essence, we are more likely to agree to the demands of people we know and love. Even with people we don't know, the principle of liking is powerful and easily exploited. The liking principle explains why dignified-looking political candidates are often more victorious in their campaigns and why car ads often feature attractive people. In each case, our natural wish to like something is being stimulated. The principle also explains product endorsements by celebrities. People want to take on the positive and healthy image of the star, so buy the product they are seen to be using, even if it is more expensive or inferior to similar products. So how do you avoid falling for the liking trap? If you feel that you have fallen into liking another party unusually quickly, then be vigilant. It's likely you're being manipulated. It's well known that one of the key traits of sociopaths is that they are often unusually charismatic, and they know that being liked is the first step in gaining another's confidence. Once they have your confidence, you can be exploited for their ends. When it comes to buying things, Cialdini says, Always retain a kind of barrier, a distance between the trader, who you may like, and the transaction itself. Decisions should be made solely on the basis of whether the offer itself is good or bad. This time, we continued our look into Robert Cialdini's influence. We learned about three more principles of influence, consistency, social proof, and liking. A consistent message goes a long way to ensuring trust. Social proof is the new psychological habit of following a crowd's opinion in order to belong. Liking is buying into a product because of your attraction to it or those who use it. Next time, we'll conclude our book Insight into Influence. We'll look into authority and scarcity. And 
enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Social psychologist Robert Cialdini wrote his best-selling book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, to teach readers to not only be persuasive, but also to defend themselves from the persuaders. We're concluding our dive into influence this episode by learning about Cialdini's final two principles of influence, authority and scarcity. The fifth principle of influence is authority. Even adults who are strong, independent thinkers will sometimes make completely irrational decisions in order to obey apparent authority. Here is Cialdini himself on the Masters in Business show. It normally makes sense. Now, I'm thinking of authority as being an authority rather than being in authority, right? Somebody who's an expert, somebody who's knowledgeable, somebody who's a, an, a, uh, an authoritative voice on a particular topic. It makes great sense to follow the lead of the people who know the most about that topic. What is it about a person that makes us see them as authoritative? Cialdini refers to the three symbols of title, clothing, and trappings. An authoritative title is both the most difficult and most easily obtained symbol of authority. It is difficult because it takes years of hard work to gain one. And it is easy because people freely label themselves all the time with a title they haven't earned. For instance, plenty of quacks go around calling themselves doctor, obtained their Ph.D. via mail order, or in an area that has nothing to do with their current practice. Clothing is another symbol of authority. There are many examples of people dressing up as a means of enacting fraudulent activity. When scammers don a white coat, they are not specifically lying, but they know that most of us will take the coat to mean they are a qualified doctor or some other medical professional. Cialdini warns about making instant assumptions based on appearance. A third symbol of authority is trappings. This can be presented in many ways, such as glamorous clothing, gorgeous jewelry, and flashy sports cars. For example, a study in the San Francisco Bay Area showed that owners of luxury cars are more likely to receive special respect and have their requests satisfied. The first thing a scammer does is buy or rent a prestige car. They are exploiting the natural human weakness for appearances and symbols. Why is it that the more a film is censored, the more people want to watch it? Why, during auctions, do people involuntarily raise their paddle despite the price already exceeding their expectations? These phenomena are all work of Cialdini's sixth principle of influence, scarcity. It is based on the simple assumption that things that are rare are precious. When we see something that we want has become rare, we impulsively try to get it and in the process lose our rational compass. Marketers know that marking something as limited availability or imposing a deadline for an offer stimulate people's loss aversion instinct, meaning our fear of loss is greater than our desire to gain. As Cialdini puts it, if you make it scarce, even garbage can become valuable. Every new year, malls have their big sales. People rush into the store to grab things they normally wouldn't buy. We now also get caught up in Cyber Monday sales online. Because these sales are only for one day, we're terrified of losing out. Real estate agents trying to sell a house to a hesitant buyer will often tell the customer that other buyers have seen the house, have expressed interest in buying it, and there are more coming tomorrow. The scarcity feeling kicks in with the hesitant buyer, and they make a hasty offer. Sometimes couples will find themselves at the mercy of the scarcity principle, too. The woman complains that her boyfriend doesn't care about her. She might list other men wanting to date her so as to motivate her boyfriend. Although this is probably a fabrication, it has the desired effect. The boyfriend pledges his love for the woman. Especially when in a direct competitive environment, people are more likely to lose their sense of reason. So we must always remind ourselves that rare things are not always better just because they are difficult to obtain. Whether the item is scarce or abundant, its function is the same. 
This time on Book Insights, we discussed six principles from influence. These principles are ways our lives and our behaviors can be manipulated. A quick recap. First, we saw the principle of reciprocation and the instinct to repay in kind. Second, there was the principle of commitment and consistency. Third, the principle of social proof and conformity behavior. Fourth, the principle of liking. Fifth, the authority principle that leads to blind obedience. And sixth, the scarcity principle. After the book Influence was written, in 2016, Cialdini wrote of a seventh principle in the book Persuasion, a revolutionary way to influence and persuade. He added unity to the other six principles we discussed. He describes this latest principle as the way marketers like luxury car, clothing, and tech companies get us to buy something by exploiting our natural wish to feel part of a tribe or group. What all these examples point to is that when marketing is at its best, it doesn't even require persuasion. It's more about understanding and identifying the triggers for action, implementing them, and then letting people naturally respond accordingly. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.